unsolved. The John Bonet Ramsey case. Maybe you've heard of her, John Benet Ramsey. She was murdered in her home in Boulder, and no one has been arrested. John Benet's parents were married in Atlanta on November 5th, 1980. John Ramsey was born in Nebraska on December 7th, 1943 and he lived his youth and high school days in Michigan. And Patsy Ann Paul was born in West Virginia on December 29, 1956. Patricia Ann Paul, Miss West Virginia. I'm a junior at West Virginia University. Patsy was a graduate of West Virginia University with a BA in journalism in 1978. And in her junior year, she was Miss West Virginia in 1977. John Ramsey was a graduate of Michigan State University in 1966 and earned a master's degree in 1971. And he enlisted in officer's training in the United States Navy and was a member of the Navy from 1966 till 1969, where he served at a station in the Philippine Islands. Here's a photograph of the Ramsey family in the 1980s. And John had been previously married, and so he had three children, Elizabeth, Melinda, and John Andrew. John Benet Ramsey was born on August 6, 1990, and Burke had been born in 1987. The Ramsey family, John, Patsy, Burke, and John Benet, moved to Boulder, Colorado in November 1991. John's older children lived in the Atlanta area with their mother. Tragedy struck in 1992 around Christmas time when John's oldest daughter, Elizabeth, and her boyfriend died in an automobile accident in the Chicago area. December 1996. John Ramsey is age 53, and he's the president of Axis Graphics, and they've just sold more than $1 billion in products across the United States and in several other countries. Burke Ramsey, age 9, is in fourth grade. John Andrew is in college at Colorado State University in Boulder. Patsy Ramsey, age 39, is a stay-at-home mom who spends most of her time volunteering at her children's elementary school. John Benet Ramsey is age 6 and has just started kindergarten. And she owns this little white cute dog that spends part of its time over at the neighbor's house, Joe and Betty Barnhills. A little bit about High Peaks Elementary School. It was started in 1995 by a group of parents that wanted to see high academic achievement in their children. That was more of the focus. So Burke was in the fourth grade and John Bonet started kindergarten in August of 1996 there. So a lot of Patsy and John's friends were the parents of students at that school, like the Steins, the Fernies, 
the walkers, and ironically, not the whites. Fleet and Priscilla had their children remain at the their area elementary school. High Peaks Elementary School was several miles south of where the Ramses lived, closer to the Fernie's house. And so they had to be driven to school. Nevertheless, Fleet and Priscilla seemed to be John and Patsy's most closest friends in Boulder. December 6, Lights of December Parade. December 22nd, Southwest Plaza Mall. December 23rd, Ramsey Christmas Party with Santa Claus. December 24th, Dinner at Pasta J's. Christmas Eve, driving around looking at Christmas lights and driving up to the star on the hillside. Christmas morning, opening presents early. Sometime afternoon, John Ramsey heads off to Jeffco Airport for about three to four hours, and he returns sometime after 4 p.m. At 5 p.m., the Ramsey family head over to Fleet and Priscilla White's house. And then here is the last known photograph of John Bonet Ramsey. According to John and Patsy, John Bonet fell asleep in the car on the way home from the White's house, and John carried John Bonet up to bed, and Patsy put her in bed. Now, both children had an extra bed in their room. Now, we really don't know for sure what the Ramses did when they got home from the White's house. Supposedly, Bert played with a toy. Patsy was the first one to bed. John put Bert to bed, and then he went up and got in bed. And so, that's what we're told what happened. Now, at this point in the video, I think it's important to show you the layout of the Ramsey's household. So here's the front door and the foyer and the living room and the dining room and the breakfast room. And then here is the main portion of where everything took place. And you can see the breakfast room, you can see the grating that covered the windows down in the basement where the window was broken. And you can see the kitchen, and you can see the telephone on the wall in the kitchen just outside the hallway. And then here is where the main action took place. And you can see the spiral staircase, the location of the ransom note, and the table right there that contained the writing pad in which the ransom note came from. And then there's the study where they put the tap on the phone waiting for the ransomer to call. And then the back of the house, the garage, and out towards the back alleyway. Sometime in the middle of the night, John Bonet was taken to the basement, assaulted, strangled, and her skull was fractured. And we're not sure exactly the order that those things took place. Approximately 5.45 a.m., Patsy opened John Bonet's door and John Bonet was missing. Patsy had told the police that she had found the three-page ransom note at the bottom of the spiral staircase. Now, the first page of the three-page note begins with Mr. Ramsey, 
And then the first paragraph states, we have your daughter and follow our directions. The second paragraph demands $118,000 and make sure to bring an adequate size attache. Then it states, I will call you between 8 and 10 a.m. tomorrow. The third and final paragraph starts with, any deviation of my instructions will lead to the death of your daughter. The two gentlemen don't particularly like you. Don't talk to a stray dog. Don't tamper with the money. You will be scanned for electronic devices. 99% chance of killing your daughter if you try to outsmart us. And if you follow our instructions, 100% chance of getting her back. Then the author of the ransom note uses John's first name. Don't grow a brain. Don't underestimate us. And use that southern common sense of yours. Then the note closes with victory, exclamation mark, S-B-T-C. Patsy called 911. And then she called Priscilla White and Barbara Fernie. Now at 6 a.m. that morning, Patsy was on the first floor waiting for the police. John Ramsey was on the third floor getting dressed, and Burke was on the second floor in his bedroom, supposedly asleep. Boulder police officer Rick French arrived at the Ramsey residence, and then Carl Veach arrived there and they looked around for signs of forced entry. The first friend to arrive was John Fernie, and he went to the back door, which was a glass door, and he could look through it, and he saw the three-page ransom note lying on the floor, and he read some of it. Then he came around to the front of the house and was let in. The next person to arrive was Fleet White. He parked his truck in the front and came to the front door. Next to arrive was Priscilla White. And I'm not sure if she drove along with Fleet or she drove her own car. Then shortly after getting to the Ramsey's house, Fleet White went down to the basement and called for John Bonet and looked around for John Bonet in the train room and in the boiler room. And he opened the door that went into the so-called wine cellar, and it was pitch black inside, and he didn't see anything. He couldn't find the light switch, and then he closed the door and went upstairs. Now the next friend to arrive was Barbara Fernie, and she had come at least a half hour after Fleet and Priscilla, and also were two crime victim advocates that showed up to comfort Patsy and John while they waited for the ransom call to come in between 8 and 10 a.m. And then at about 7.15 a.m., the Reverend Roland Hoverstock arrived to give comfort to the family. Shortly after the Reverend arrived, it was decided that Burke was to be woken up and taken over to Fleet White's house. So Fleet, John Fernie, and Burke left the house. And John Fernie went to the bank to obtain the $118,000 ransom. Fleet White returned pretty shortly after dropping off Burke at his house. Shortly after 8 a.m., Detective Linda Art showed up at the Ramsey residence, and she instructed John on how to take the ransom call that he was to ask to speak to John Bonet and to tell the ransomers they couldn't obtain the money until 5 p.m. that night. 
Then John Fernie returned to the Ramsey house after obtaining the money and the police taking the money away from him and taking it down to the station to be photocopied. Now that morning, several people called before the 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. time frame for the ransom call to come in and during that time. And so Rod Westmoreland had called about the ransom money and Mike Archuleta had called about the planned flight to Charlevoix, Michigan. But the person who took John Bonet to the basement did not call. Now, sometime that morning, John Ramsey remembered that he had broken a basement window during the summer to get into his house because he was locked out and didn't have a key. So he went down to the basement, went over to the window, and noticed that it was slightly open. And so he pushed it closed and he latched it. And then he came upstairs, but he didn't tell anybody that he had went down to the basement. Now around noon, all the police personnel decided, hey, it's lunchtime. And so they took off and went to get something to eat, except for Detective Linda Art. And she had the responsibility of staying there with the Ramses and their friends. Detective Art decided to have John Ramsey, Fleet White, and John Fernie go look throughout the house to see if they could find anything unusual or that stuck out to them. John Ramsey went downstairs to the basement. He showed Fleet White the broken window in the suitcase underneath the window. Then he went to the boiler room, opened the wine cellar door, screamed that he found John Bonet and then picked her up and carried her upstairs and placed her dead body on the living room floor. The autopsy report listed ligature strangulation, skull fractures, abrasions on several parts of her body. She had fragments of pineapple in her digestive tract and she was sexually abused and possibly molested prior to that night. And there was a bodily fluid smeared on her thighs which turned out to be her blood. The public was upset. The media went into a frenzy. Should a six-year-old girl be participating in beauty contests? Did these public appearances lead to her death? Patsy and John immediately took actions to protect their reputation. They retained separate lawyers for each of them they went on CNN and gave their side of what took place that day after Christmas. And then they had a press conference offering a reward to find the killer of John Bonet Ramsey. Mervyn Pugh was the husband of the Ramsey's housekeeper, Linda Hoffman. And Linda Hoffman had a key and she had some money troubles. And so Mervyn could have hatched a plan to kidnap John Bonet. Maybe his plan or whoever planned to ransom John Bonet 
was to simply take her to the basement, kill her, and hide her down in one of the storage areas in the wine cellar, and then make the ransom note very threatening not to call the police. And the plan was that the Ramses would not have called the police. And then maybe they found out that the Ramses did call the police, and therefore they never called to try to get the ransom money. Glenn Meyer was a tenant and lived in the basement of Joe and Betty Barnhill, the ones that watched John Bonet's little white dog. Glenn would have known that the dog was not at the Ramsey's house because it was at the Barnhill's house. He knew John Bonet. He probably could have got access to a key because Joe and Betty Barnhill had a key. And maybe Glenn's motive was he was a child molester. And he wrote the ransom note because he was a neighbor of the Ramses, And he wanted to make it look like somebody from some distance had attempted to kidnap John Bonet that night. And then there's this theory that somebody at John's business was angry with him. And so they snuck in on Christmas night and took out their revenge against John by killing his daughter. But why such an elaborate ransom note? Why does it matter how many hundred dollar bills and how many twenty dollar bills and the size of the attache that they're to bring to the bank and that they're rested and maybe we'll call earlier Maybe there was a specific reason that these details were written into the ransom note, and that's why it got so long, that it was important that whoever read this ransom note knew this information. And what about the pineapple and John Bonet's digestive tract? Fleet and Priscilla White said they did not serve pineapple that night. And the autopsy report said that her stomach was just about empty and the pineapple was just below her stomach, as you can see in this diagram. Did an unknown intruder feed John Bonet some pineapple before he killed her? Patsy would wake John Bonet up around midnight to make sure she used the bathroom. Sometimes Patsy was just in the nick of time, but sometimes she was too late. Did John Bonet wet the bed? Did Patsy lose control of herself? Was Patsy up all night covering up this accident? <laughs> The three pages of the ransom note were torn out of Patsy's notepad. The pen used to write the note, the police determined, was from a pen holder in the kitchen, and the pen was placed right back with the other pens. The ransom note has the same paragraph indentations, the exclamation marks, and it looks like it was written by a college-educated journalism student. Before sunlight, at least one police officer looked for prints in the snow when he arrived at the Ramsey's household, and he didn't find any prints. If the intruder entered through the basement window, and when he left, did he actually close the window behind him and replace the grating back over the window well? And did John Ramsey place the suitcase under the window and point this out to Fleet White? And did he break one of Patsy's 
paintbrush handles and tie this knot. Hoffman, did you receive any training in sailing? Ramsey, no. Are you familiar with the various knots involved in sailing? I really not. I should be, but I'm not. Hoffman, have you had an occasion to be able to look at the knot that was tied around the so-called paintbrush garrote? Ramsey, I have not. Well, this ends this episode of Unsolved, and next week we will either follow up with this episode or we will present The Trial of Patsy Ramsey. So I'll see you next weekend.